Well, ESCOM's Group Chief Executive Andre de Reiter says for many years the tendency was to build huge power plants like Kusile and Mudupi, which are, of course, among the largest in the world. But he says these massive plants suffer from cost overruns and scheduled delays, not just in South Africa, but around the world. Answering questions at a webinar hosted by the Free Market Foundation, de Reiter also made mention of decentralization of electricity and buying from a generator of choice of people creating power from their rooftops and, of course, the massive amounts of money owed to ESCOM by municipalities. One of the key issues raised at the webinar was ESCOM's intention to make solar power owners pay for using the grid. Let's talk about this and other energy-related matters. Now we're joined by Clyde Mallinson from Virtual Energy and Power. Good to have you, Clyde. Thanks so much for being our guest on the program. Thanks, Leanne, and morning to you and morning to your listeners, if anyone actually gets up this early in the morning. Uh, You'll be surprised. Someone's (laughs) got to start. uh, We've got to start that engine early, even though I started my engine early with no electricity. And this is this has become a way of life for so many South Africans. I woke up to absolute darkness. And, you know, it's getting frustration, very, very frustrating, Clyde, because it just feels like it's not getting any better and it's not going anywhere. I mean, from your analysis, what, what do you think, before we even get into what was discussed yesterday, in terms of where we're at at the moment with power supply? Right. I think, well, the, the key thing to recognize, first of all, is that the whole world is in an energy transition and it's happening so rapidly that many of us are actually missing it, if that's possible. You remember the rapid switch from from box TVs to flat screen TVs. And if you now were to try and go and find a box TV, it would almost be impossible. So that's happening. And it's happening very, very rapidly. Um, And it's just a question of how we manage this transition rather than whether or not the transition is going to happen. And one of the things Andre pointed out when he started his discussion is they are very cognizant of this changing energy supply scenario globally. (coughs) The challenge, of course, is to manage moving from the old and all the people that are attached to the old by way of jobs and and supply chains and the like into this new world of decentralized um, electricity generation. And that's that's, that's difficult globally. Mm. I think Andre mentioned in the UK when they shut down the coal mines, they didn't do it very, um, uh, they didn't do it with enough recognition of the impact that would have on the coal mining communities and those uh, villages and things that were tied to that. And I think that he's very cognizant that when we make this transition, which we will make, we need to do it in a uh, fashion that uh, takes cognizance of the people it's going to affect and takes cognizance of the fact that it is, in fact, going to happen. Yeah, and it is happening. It is happening. I mean, we know this. We see this happening all the time. Everybody, I mean, uh, companies that are, are, are providing alternative energy sources are doing exceptionally well at a time like this. And but the reality is it's not a, it's not a very cheap option either. So it is it, it does come with with a cost. I mean, let, let's talk about that as well. Well, well, in fact, that's no longer true, and that's a that's a, a a message, really, or an indication of the speed with which it is happening. So, if we were to wake up tomorrow morning and the whole coal fleet had gone, sort of disappeared into the mist of Mpumalanga, and we replaced it with a brand new coal fleet, uh, one that that worked well, um, or if we replaced it with a with a renewable fleet made up. Uh, primarily of solar, wind, and and storage. The solar, wind, and storage fleet would cost us about 100 billion rand a year less to operate and finance than a brand new coal fleet. So it's not true that it's an expensive decision. Five years ago, if we looked at the same analysis, uh, the coal fleet would probably have come in at 100 billion rand a year less than a renewable fleet. And that just indicates the speed with which things are changing. Mm. So the advantage now, which I think Andre also picked up in his presentation, 
is that we find ourselves at a point when the coal fleet is naturally retiring and it's almost a case of us having stalled for a while. We've, we've got to a point now where it's actually the economics have flipped. And we can do this now not just um, as, as, as the right thing to do with regard to externality costs like health and climate, but we can actually do it in a way that will be economically advantageous to the whole country rather than uh, us having to subsidise it in some other form. Yeah. I mean, we also heard... So that's very exciting news, in my opinion. I, 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 supp- I mean, it certainly is. I mean, if we go back to the, um, the, the State of the Nation address where the president spoke to renewable energy as well and, and spoke to the fact that, you know, he was talking about this bid window and saying that uh, the 2,600 megawatts of wind and solar energy would finally be procured as part of government's bid window five in the next few weeks and then another round in August. Is this promising? Because this has been, I mean, there's been a lot of delays on this one. It it, it is promising, but it's very difficult to try and regulate rapid change. And so, you know, my my beef with these various uh, interventions is that, first of all, they're not carried out by ESCOM. They're carried out by separate departments, normally Department of Mineral Resources and Energy. So ESCOM, in a way, are having to to look after the old, whereas the Department of Mineral Resources and Energy is allowing the new in. And the speed with which the old is dying is not being matched by the speed with which the new is being brought into the system. And that's the mismatch that we face. So although we're now looking at these new opportunities with the risk mitigation program and bid windows five and maybe even six and seven coming this year, uh, we must recognize that there's been a gap of about six years since the last bid window. Mm. And that just highlights the fact that we are not keeping abreast of the um, aging coal fleet auto-retiring and making sure that we build enough of the new fleet to give the ESCOM the headroom they need to be able to then retire the coal fleet, uh, as I like to say, with a bit of dignity. It served us well and it deserves a good burial, but it needs to be planned and orchestrated. And at the Mm -hmm. moment, there is some frustration in that the new is not coming in at the right speed to match the shutting down of the old. And that really is the disconnect that we have at the moment. Yeah, it certainly is. And, and let's, let's go back and talk now to, to you know, the, the, the consumer who has decided, and as we mentioned at the beginning of the interview, a lot of people have decided to sort of, you know, go off the grid and, and decide to uh, go ahead and um, generate their own electricity on rooftops, completely off the grid or, or partially off the grid. But then, of course, course, there's this, this big concern um, about ESCOM charging for the use of the grid for those using solar and other methods seemed to be uh, a real concern. I mean, this is, this is a big talking point. Let's get a bit of clarity now. L- talk to us about this point. Okay, so, so very simply, if one puts solar on one's residential property, um, you reduce your ESCOM bill. If you put a battery in, with your residential property. You, you, can, you can obviously use solar then in the evening, some of the night. The problem comes when you have uh, uh, a couple of overcast days in a row, perhaps. If you try and go off-grid completely by building a system which has sufficient storage to see you through um, uh, a couple of days with, with poor solar. And let me first be specific. When we have overcast days, we still get output from solar, uh, probably about 30% of what we get on a sunny day. Mm. So it's not as if it switches on and off depending on whether the sun's shining or not. About a third of the energy created from solar is from what we call radiated or scattered light, which is, is typical of the sort of the fact that it's light in the morning, although it's overcast. Um, To try and go off-grid completely is very expensive. You would have to build an oversized battery system. And effectively what we do is we rely then on the grid to be our so-called battery on the days when our solar system isn't producing enough. And what ESCOM was saying is that they are having to have that uh, grid available for us on the occasions that we suddenly need it. And there's an expense 
involved with that, not just in the fact that ESCOM have to generate that or, or be able to generate that surplus for people who, whose batteries have run out, but they also have to supply and manage and look after the grid that delivers it. So, you know, the way I like to look at it is if, if, you, if you buy a pizza at a, at, a, at a pizza shop, the pizza at the shop door is the cost of producing the pizza. Then the pizza still has to be delivered to you. And that delivery fee is really what ESCOM are looking for in terms of keeping the grid well maintained and, and um, up to date. And then, of course, many of us would give the, the pizza driver a tip at the end of that, and that tip is often related to some of the things that we all have to pay, things like rural, electri rural electrification subsidies, which gives ESCOM um, additional funds to be able to roll out electricity in areas that have previously not been um, able to have electricity um, in, 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 in areas where the grid doesn't exist mm, and mm. it's expensive to, to do that. Yeah. So, um, so I think there's been a big increase in the number of people who have electricity delivered to them. But there is a cost in that delivery. And what ESCOM is saying at the moment, the cost structures are such that they don't reflect the cost of the pizza and the cost of delivering the pizza separately. They're all kind of wrapped up in a single bill. Yeah. And what they're really trying to do is to disaggregate the costs into the different components so that people are more conscious. If you don't put a big battery in, you save yourself a lot of money, but you need to then pay ESCOM um, an amount that reflects them providing that battery for you. Indeed. Well, I suppose if we keep on with your pizza analysis, I mean, it's, it's, it's at the end <laughs> of the day, a lot of people have been paying for pizzas that they have not been receiving. And so they go oh. out, <laughs> exactly, they go out and they find another pizza delivery guy who actually brings it and puts <laughs> the pizza on their roof and then it works for them. Uh, but now we've got to pay the original guy to use that. So, you know, it is confusing and I can see that a lot of people, uh, why people are getting upset is that, I mean, initially if everything was working, okay, they wouldn't have had to lay out the expense of putting that up in the first place. So, I mean, it's a big conversation. It really is. So it'll be interesting to see how this develops in terms of, 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 of getting forward and ESCOM actually getting that money. But Clyde, I want to ask you also a little bit about um, the, the issue of ESCOM still enjoying a monopoly, because this was brought up during the webinar yesterday. Um, what happened to the restructuring process announced in 2010? I mean, I mean, I know that De Reuter said that if a nuclear power plant were to be constructed, ESCOM would be the only default um, realtor operator of such a facility. And it's been a concern for business that ESCOM still enjoys monopoly. And the Free Market Foundation says the government doesn't show any intention of opening up to competition in generation and supply of electricity and really wants to continue dominating the South African market. Talk to us about this. Well, 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 I think that was very much the case in the past, and I think it's very much in the past now. And one of the interesting things, if one has watched Andre de Rete in particular over the last year, each time he speaks publicly, whether it's at, at, at the invitation of the South African Editors Forum or whether it's at the invitation of the Free, free Marketeers or the Free Marketeers, marketeers um, when he speaks, each time he speaks, he, he can be seen to be pushing the boat out into the water slightly further than the last time he spoke. So he's navigating the uh, history and the politics of things that have happened in the past. And each time he speaks, he gives an extra little push. So you will have heard him saying that although there's been a big debate that one should open the market to anything from uh, a great, uh, up to 10 megawatts as not requiring a NURSA license. Andre Dorator has actually come out and said that he agrees with people who are calling for the removal of licenses up to 50 megawatts. So he's pushed the boat a little bit further, but he's got to push the boat out, but he can't rock the boat. It's up to people like myself to rock the boat and say, come on, Andre, uh, let, let's, let's really open this thing up and let's be clear about the regulatory environment. So it's clear at the moment that uh, the Minister of Mineral Resources and Energy has said that, that mines and the like and people can, can supply for their own use, 
But what's not clear is exactly how they should go about this, particularly when it comes to what we call wheeling across the grid or delivering of the pizza. Mm -hmm. So, yes, um, Andre is looking at a, a democratization, particularly at the municipal level, where you would be able to have a choice of who you would purchase your electricity from on, on the retail side of things. But I prefer to look at democratization as giving average South Africans an opportunity of investing in this new electricity fleet and democratizing the ownership of the actual fleet as opposed to simply democratizing our choice yeah. of whom we buy electricity from. Yeah, yeah. I want to quickly touch on the issue of municipalities. Sorry, Clyde, there was so much discussed and there is so much to of discuss. Course. It really of was. Course. I want to talk about that very quickly before we wrap up. Um, municipalities owe a lot of money. ESCOM has, of course, been working hard to recover this money um, and uh, in a way of actually attaching some of the municipalities. Would you say that they're winning this one? I mean, they're saying that there's about 36 billion rand that, owe be, that is owed to them. I, I personally think that a lot of that's going to unfortunately have to be written off at some point and they're going to have to start. We, we need to recognize that we have too many municipalities in the country that are, that are dysfunctional, whether it's in paying their ESCOM bills or keeping their, their water systems working or fixing their potholes. These, these dysfunctionality and there needs to be a rebuilding, if you like, of the civil servants who work within municipalities. One of the interesting things is that when you're looking at renewable energy, the marginal cost of producing extra renewable energy is exceptionally low. So if you're producing X amount and you want to produce a bit more, it doesn't cost that much more because there's no fuel requirements. So I'm actually predicting that the solution, certainly for residential non-payment in municipalities is imminent in the sense that I'm predicting that ESCOM and municipalities themselves in the very near future will be able to offer uncapped electricity usage for residential households. Sure. Uh, a bit like we saw with, with, with broadband mm. and, and internet access. No one, I think, buys packages anymore. Most people, many people have what we call uncapped. So you pay for the speed of upload and download in other words, the size of your circuit breaker, but you can use as much electricity as you like. And I predict that's going to happen. Interesting. All right. Thanks for talking to us, Clyde. Um, talking to us what uh, uh, is all about the power and the future of power here in South Africa. Clyde Mallinson, Virtual Energy and Power. That's where he's from. Uh, talking about our current and future generating of electricity in South Africa. Let's take a quick break. We'll have your news after this. Stay tuned.